Good morning. Thank you for joining us in worship at Church Street United Methodist Church here in downtown Knoxville, Tennessee. We are honored that you have chosen to be with us this morning. Would you please join me in our call to worship, which we will read responsively? This is from Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when foes rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us. Then the raging waters would have gone over us. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. generosity exceeds all the limits we place upon ourselves. So we must ask, how will our manner of life reflect the abundance of God's mercy? Our offerings are one measure of our response. Let us present them to God with joy and thanksgiving. Hear this prayer of gratitude. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to express our love to you through the gifts we bring to support and encourage your work in near and distant places. Make our hearts glad that we can share in extending the gospel and helping to heal humanity's pain, for we bring them to you with grateful hearts. Amen.
join me in our prayer for illumination. Spirit of God, remove from us all stumbling blocks to our hearing the good news of Christ Jesus. By your grace, make us to hear, empower us to speak, and give us wisdom to make room for your mysterious presence. Amen. The Gospel lesson this morning is from Mark chapter 9, starting with the 38th verse and reading through the 50th. And this morning we're reading from the New Revised Standard Version. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, pour out your spirit upon us this day that in hearing your word proclaimed, we would be refreshed and brought into life with you. Mark could serve as a comparative study between worldly power and the power of God. Last week, we heard Jesus challenge his disciples to welcome the powerless into their midst. Before that, we read of Jesus' rebuke to Peter for suggesting that suffering was not the path of power for the Lord's anointed. Catherine has just read for us how the disciples are concerned that someone who is not part of their community is using the power of Jesus' name to cast out demons. This is an issue of boundaries and belonging in the community, but it is really a much larger issue of power. Who has been prepared properly for leadership? What is the hierarchy that is in place for this community? This, these issues have been bubbling to the surface in our readings from chapters 8 and 9. This week, Jesus responds to the disciples striving for control and power with a clear choice. A disciple must choose between the creative power of the gospel or the power that leads to a dumpster fire. The disciples bring a serious concern before Jesus. A man who is not submitted to their teaching and in no way could be understood to be a follower of Jesus is casting out demons by using Jesus' name. In fairness to the disciples, their concern makes sense. This demon hunter seems to be simply using Jesus. Does he really believe Jesus is the Messiah? Is he doing this just for income or for a show? Where was he trained? No one recalls seeing him at the last gathering of the disciples. If the power of Jesus' name is being invoked by an outsider, then the disciples must surely react in a way to protect Jesus. Peter has already, already demonstrated his commitment to protecting Jesus from suffering and any sort of trouble at first, and now the concern is to protect Jesus' power. Andy Crouch has written that power is a gift. He 
defines this gift as the, abil the ability to create or make. The spiritual forces of wickedness, the demonic, the powers and principalities, whatever we call these things, seek to warp, harm, and undo God's good creation. These forces stifle creativity and deface the beauty God has formed within the world. This exorcist may not be a part of Jesus' community, but Jesus recognizes that he is using power as it should be used. Casting out demons returns agency to individuals and to communities. Demon-free people are able to create, to dream, to love, and to share joy. Perhaps we all have some demons that we would love to be free of, that we might dream and love and joy a little bit more. Jesus' mission is to free the world for joyful and creative obedience to God. Put another way, Jesus has come to give to all the world abundant life. Isn't, isn't abundant life what much of human striving for power is all about anyway? Jesus challenges the assumptions of the disciples about the power this exorcist wields by using Jesus' name. When Jesus' name is used to redeem even a little corner of creation, it is a participation in the work of Christ. Such displays of power are a witness to Christ. Even if the speaker of the name doesn't know or understand. Jesus then shifts the narrative again. The disciples want to talk about the behavior of others, about this exorcist or anyone else, but Jesus forces the conversation back to a discussion about the behavior of the disciples. Jesus has repeatedly taught his disciples that to stand against the destructive and coercive powers of the world will lead to suffering. First, Jesus himself will, lead, will suffer, and then those who follow him will suffer. Jesus warns a would-be disciple not to place stumbling blocks for the little ones in our midst. Jesus is certainly recalling the child he's placed in the middle of the disciples from last week's reading, but he means not just children, but all of those with very little agency or power. Even as little children, people can find ways to make themselves feel powerful over others. I think of the example of the anthill and the little boy with a magnifying glass. A child discovers that they can use a small little piece of specialized glass and cause panic, pain, and disorder on a little anthill. The same gift that would allow us to create and to learn, to see a little bit clearer, is harnessed to cause harm. When Jesus references hell in our lesson, He's speaking of Gehenna. He, he says literally Gehenna, the word Gehenna, which is the Valley of Hinnom outside of Jerusalem. Gehenna is a valley that had been used as a place to sacrifice children to the pagan deity Molech by throwing them into fire. By Jesus' time, the valley had become a garbage dump. It was a place where a smoldering fire could always be found and the stench of burning garbage filled the air. Jesus is indeed using a commonly understood reference to create a metaphor to describe those efforts in those places where we seek to live apart from God and by our own power. Several years ago, I was asked by a dear parishioner why Methodist pastors didn't seem to preach about hell anymore. At the time, I responded by saying that I just thought it was far more important to proclaim Christ crucified and resurrected than to spend time, too much time speculating about eternal punishment. I still largely stand by that statement, but I wonder now if she may have been asking a deeper question than I first assumed. I wonder if she had noticed in the midst of her life that hell seemed very real and active in the world, and so felt the need to hear some guidance from her pastors. Hell is real. When other Judeans did forcefully resist the power of Rome, the city and the temple were destroyed, many innocent people died, and the whole city was turned into one large, burning trash heap. Human striving for dominating power leads to Gehenna for some, if not for all. Jesus presents a different vision and a challenge to his disciples. 
Jesus offers the disciples the power to serve, to find peace and creativity in restored relationship with God. Some began following Jesus, seeking a renewed and restored Israel. They longed for the oppressive power of Rome to be overthrown. Indeed, that power is overthrown by Christ. But had Jesus led a violent revolution and somehow won, destructive power would still be in charge. The little ones would still find a stumbling block in their path. It just would have simply moved somewhere else in the path. It is at this point, if Jesus hadn't already overwhelmed us with his inspiring imagery of hell and millstones, that he then talks about removing hands and feet and plucking out eyes. The phrase I find helpful is that the instruction concludes by stating that it would be better entering life missing body parts than being cast into Gehenna with all your limbs. Jesus doesn't lose any limbs, but his body is pierced and broken, yet he enters into life. His body isn't around to be cast into the smoldering heap of Gehenna because he is resurrected and ushers in the kingdom of God. And this is the power offered to the first disciples and offered to us today. We are called to follow Jesus. We're invited to cast out the demonic forces in our midst, to challenge oppression, and to find freedom in obedience to Christ. Jesus' power refuses to cause suffering, but rather endures suffering alongside fallen creation. In Christ's faithfulness to the Father and to the world he loves, redemption is one for all creation. And this is the path set before us. In the church, we call this discipleship. And it's all about how we will relate to God and to others. Relationships always involve power. Who has it? Will it be shared? What is the end of the power present? Is the power of God transforming us and restoring our lives? Or do we seek our own power, which may for a while preserve our lives, but will eventually lead to destruction, even more suffering and weeping in the Valley of Hinnom? Our lesson today ends with a slightly cryptic, but ultimately hopeful promise. Disciples are instructed to be salty, to have flavor and add flavor to the world around them. Jesus will make the kingdom come, but we are to be a taste of the kingdom. The ultimate power of the church is found in being a taste of the kingdom of God. The exorcist that that started the the whole conversation even if he did not intend to, has provided a taste of the kingdom for the world. Jesus recognizes that by engaging the power of his name, transformation will follow. If we act boldly out of our faith in Christ, how might we, in the world, be transformed even more fully? Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of sun and moon, star and sky, your wonder is beyond our imagining. We thank you for the gifts of this world we share and for the common bonds that we share as your children. Bless us, God, as we seek to find a way toward the peace you invite us to share. Guide us, God, as we walk that delicate line between being faithful to our own relationship with you and yet remain understanding of those whose path is vastly different from our own. Remind us often that being faithful does not require that we close ourselves off from the faith of others. Open our hearts, minds, and spirits to people of every faith and culture. May the mystery of your ways be the bridge that draws all of your people together in prayer for peace in our time. We pray for those who are in special need of your grace and healing today, for those who live in fear of violence, for refugees everywhere, for political prisoners or and for those who imprison them. God, we ask for peace. For those who are grieving or hungry or in despair, 
for the lonely and all who are ill or suffering, for those who struggle with addiction, and for all who live with chronic illness. God, we trust in your power to be present with the suffering. We trust in your Spirit's power to bring comfort, faith, and strength where it is needed. We pray, bring your radical, scandalous peace into our midst and touch us all with your love. For we ask it in the name of the one who calls us ever forward, Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Having heard God's word proclaimed this morning, let us go forth into the world to speak the power of Christ's name for the sake of the world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 